Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Distinguished guests, can I get you to have a seat, please? Thank you so much. Yes, and DMP student, can I get you to have a seat? There we go. All distinguished guests, have a seat, please. That, that includes our the very most distinguished guests. Go ahead, you can have a seat because I got a whole, I got an introduction here. So just hang on. We got to do it. We got to do it the big blue nursing nursing way, right, guys? Okay. So welcome everyone to our distinguished leadership lecture series. As you know, I'm Janie Heath. I'm the dean of the University of Kentucky College of Nursing, and we are thrilled to see such an outpour of support for our nursing leadership lecture series. I'd like to thank all of our partners and nursing colleagues, including UK healthcare clinicians, UK College of Nursing faculty, students, alumni, and our <laughs> wide circle of friends, and nursing leaders across the Commonwealth, including our very own alumni, Delanor Manson, who is CEO of Kentucky Nurses Association. Go ahead, stand up. There we go. There we go. And you know my commercial plug, Delanor carries around an application for those of you who just quite haven't gotten your membership completed yet. We got a good deal for you today. So this week marks an historical moment for our college, as it is the first time to have some very special alumni with us. In honor of the 70th anniversary of Lyman T. Johnson's work for integration at the University of Kentucky, we are celebrating what is fondly known as our Fabulous Five. With us today are the first five African American graduates of each of our degree programs. And I get goosebumps just saying that. So let's get the Kodak, all right, Perry, get ready, because we're going to stand them up, and we're going to get our picture taken. So let me just first introduce them. These are brave, standout nurse leaders, and they all share an important bond. And we are so fortunate to have four out of the five here with us. So would you please stand as I call your name and remain standing, and we, I'm going to run down. We're going to have a Kodak moment real quick. Karina, you cannot be in this. We're doing it very fast. Okay. So, first of all, our distinguished lecturer, Mrs. Marsha Hughes-Reese, who is our first African-American BSN graduate in 1972. Please stand up and turn around. <laughs> Woo! Turn around. Okay. Keep standing. We also have with us today Mrs. Alea Mack who along with Dr. Katherine Deveridge were our first African-American MSN graduates in 1974. <laughs> Woo! Turn around, here we go. Dr. Vicki Hines Martin, who was not able to be with us this afternoon. She is the assistant dean at the University of Louisville. They need her to do some, you know, cardinal work up there. So she couldn't be with us. But she is the college's first African-American PhD graduate in 1994. So let's go ahead and give her a round of applause. And we have our very own Dr. Takia Talbert, who is an assistant hospital director here at UK Healthcare, who was the college's first African-American DMP graduate in 2005. Stand up, Takia. Out of time, so let me tell you about our distinguished lecturer, Marsha Hughes Reese. After graduating from the University of Kentucky College of Nursing in 1972, Marsha spent over 26 years as a Navy Nurse Corps officer and retired as a captain. 
just for your own information, that's kind of equivalent to a colonel in the Army. Or in our world of academe, that's equivalent to a tenured professor. So there you go. Marsha was deployed on the United States Naval Ship Comfort during Operation Desert Shield and Operation Desert Storm and has earned numerous military honors, including the Legion of Merit Medal and the Meritorious Service Medal. She earned that twice. Marsha credits Dr. Juanita Fleming, a UK College of Nursing a Maritime faculty member, as one of her nursing mentors, and is grateful to Dr. Evelyn Keller's support and commitment to helping her to truly appreciate the role of a professional nurse. Marsha earned an MSN in nursing administration from my alma mater, George Mason University. She also holds an MS in organizational development and graduate certificate in group facilitation from the Johns Hopkins University, and a graduate certificate in evidence-based coaching from Fielding Graduate University. Today, Marsha serves as adjunct faculty at Washington University in Washington, D.C., Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and is the CEO of her own business, Quo Vatas Coaching and Consulting, which is a Latin phrase that stands for where are you going? With the primary focus on organizational effectiveness, Marsha has supported hundreds of nonprofit and for profit organizations throughout the world, including over 30 hospitals on magnet recognition or pathway to excellence journey. As an executive coach, she provides developmental coaching to senior leaders and executives and consulting specifically toward diversity, inclusion, and belonging. In, 2020, in 2010, we honored Marsha as one of our 50 most outstanding alumni, and we are so fortunate to have her return today to share with us her many years of leadership expertise and helping others see where they are going so we all may lead meaningful and impactful lives for others. Please welcome Marsha. I'll give you, I'll hold up my black folder when it's 10 minutes till. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, sometimes, and I still haven't gotten over this, um, when I'm sitting down and I'm listening to somebody uh, read my bio, it's like I'm having an out of body experience. <laughs> Uh, because they're actually talking about somebody, uh, somebody else. Uh, and then I realize, oh, that's me. Uh, but I, I just really want to want to thank you, uh, uh, Dr. He, for inviting me uh, to be the distinguished lecturer. Uh, and I can assure you, the 22-year-old who graduated from here back in 1972 uh, would have never envisioned herself uh, coming back uh, to, to have this particular austere you know, uh, position. I was too busy trying to get out of school. Uh, and, and I was really you know, delighted that you gave me some liberty uh, in terms of preparing uh, uh, this presentation. I love it when people give me that liberty. Uh, so what I'm going to give you all this afternoon in the short period of time that I have is a, a little bit of my own personal story uh, a little bit of theory, and a little bit of coaching, all in about uh, 50 minutes, okay? So let's, let's see how uh, that works. Uh, you know, whether we know it or not, uh, we oftentimes are given the opportunity to make choices. Uh, whether we know it or not, uh, a lot of the choices are made for us. Uh, and when you become my age, you realize that you know, either the choices you made, you make, or the choices that have made for you, um, really and truly, it's been, been my philosophy that they begin to reflect hope and not my fears. Uh, and so I, I would like to leave that with you if I don't leave anything else with you. 
Dear Sir, this letter, le letter is to commend to you a fine soldier in your detachment, the above name Sergeant C.H. Hughes. Sergeant Hughes was on leave last week when the blizzard struck, the worst storm in the history of the Weather Bureau here. Sergeant Hughes did not sit idly at home, but made his way through the drifts to the chapter office, one of the first volunteers to arrive early on the morning, Sunday morning, November 26. We were in the midst of a full-scale disaster relief operation, handling thousands of calls for emergency deliveries of coal, milk, food, doctors, nurses, etc. Sergeant Hughes was a member of the First Mercy team that went out from this office on Sunday, November 26, and from that time on proved himself a tireless and efficient worker until he was able to return to Fort Knox on the first available transportation. We are very grateful to him, as are the countless families he brought help to in the midst of that blizzard. My father could have chosen to stay home right after Thanksgiving with me, a few months old, and my mother, and just wait for the, you know, the, the uh, roads to open up. But he chose to go out and to help others. One of my father's everlasting values was to do for the greater good, to commit to the greater good. My father had been a veteran of World War II, had come back, and like many blacks, had found that he could not really get employment. So he and my mother migrated to Ohio, where he was able to get a job, but was told that if he continued to work in the steel mill factory, that he would not live long. So my father returned to do the only real work that he knew, and that was soldiering. And he became and was a very good soldier, using that particular value throughout his career. I am my father's daughter. Just about the time, about four years later, Brown v. the Board of Education had been passed, 1954. Now, I had no clue that this particular decision would impact me mightily the rest of my growing up days. Because you see, because my father was in the Army, we had been, shortly after returning to Fort Knox and doing his basics, we had been transferred to France. And uh, so I was out on the streets of this little French village having myself a really good time uh, playing with my, uh, my French playmates uh, and had absolutely no idea of what was going on back in the United States. So when we journeyed back to the United States, and this was this would be my first time traversing the Atlantic Ocean. I think I managed to go over like five or six times the Atlantic Ocean on a ship. Uh, okay, I was coming back to a country that really and truly I did not know, did not remember, because we had moved to this French village when I was three years old. One of the memories that does stick in my head when we were visiting my grandparents who lived in the Deep South was going into a department store. And, uh, you know, like any curious six-year-old, I'm looking and I'm thinking, hmm, why would they have two water fountains? Surely a different color water must come out of one or the other. So uh, here I am going from one water fountain to the next, you know, and lo and behold, it's the same water. <laughs> now, as a six-year-old, it doesn't make sense. Six-year-old, right? But it made sense to my grandmother because she had learned the rules. She knew the rules. She knew which water fountain I should be drinking from. And 
And once the word got around to her that her little granddaughter was over playing with the water fountain, she hurriedly came over and reprimanded me for drinking out of the wrong water fountain. And I'm saying, wrong water fountain? But you see, she had been drinking from the right water fountain for years, as had the others who had alerted her that I was drinking from the wrong. And this, my friends, is when, as many of you know, racial bias can actually be implanted in our brains. And we grow up not necessarily recognizing or realizing the impact that it's going to have on you. Fortunately, my father was in the Army, and so even though I remembered this whole notion and I was curious about the water fountains, when we moved back to the Army post, I didn't have to worry about the water fountains. However, my mother, when we returned from Germany, when I was a teenager, uh, we initially moved to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and uh, about six weeks after being in Fort Bragg, my father received orders, and he received orders to Georgia. And so I had been in my sophomore year of high school when you know I had to pick up and move, which is not unusual for, for Army brats. Uh, so we go down to Georgia, and um, my mother takes us to register us for school. And the superintendent says, well, you know, your two daughters will not be able to go to the same high school. So uh, my mother is like, well, they do have grades one, I mean, nine through 12 in this high school. Oh, yes, but we have decided that we're going to only integrate every other grade. So my mother is sitting there looking, and my sister and I are kind of like, every other grade. Uh, and my mother says, well, where would me, Marcia, where would I be? Well, there's an all-black school that's about 20 miles away, and that's the school that she uh, would be uh, going to. And my mother basically said, yeah, when pigs fly. And so uh, my mother decided that she was going to take the county to court. In the meantime, I'm sitting out of school. And so I say to my mother, Mom, you know, I can't sit here and wait for you to either win or lose this case. I need to be in school. So she calls up my grandparents, who live about you know, two hours away from uh, the Army Post, where we're stationed. She wants to find out, OK, what has, how has Brown v. the Board of Education been enacted there? As far as they were concerned, you could go to school any place you wanted to go. Well, my mother sends, sends me up, and I would later learn that uh, I was going to be one of 10 or 11 black students to help integrate a school there in this little rural southern town. It really was a year for me to grow up fast because I had to learn how to deal with the hatred. I had to learn how to deal with the out and out bigotry. And at the same time, I had to really buckle down and continue learning. So I grew up pretty fast. My, my mother, she won the case. And in April, they invited me to come back uh, to go to school uh, there in uh, the county. And I said, nah, I think I've changed schools enough. And fortunately, we got orders to Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, where I would later uh, graduate. Now, when you look at these two pictures, you see me in both. But what you also see is how I grew up. I was surrounded by diversity. And so that made me very prime for being able to come to the University of Kentucky to the College of Nursing. People have asked me, 
Marcia, uh, what was it like being the first graduate or being the first at the University of Kentucky? To be quite honest with you, I didn't know I was the first. Because, you know, when you look at this picture, you can see that that's, that had been the life that I had lived. So when I looked around at the student and the students, the other students, and I didn't see any other African Americans or any other males, to be quite honest with you, um, that was actually normal. That was normal to me. Uh, and everybody thought that it was hard. Uh, the curriculum was really hard. And so I think that I just buckled down and I studied. I studied because that's what my father expected. That's what my mother expected. And of course, I was my father's daughter. I was my mother's daughter. Now, what was helpful for me in terms of attending the University of Kentucky was that two professors, and these are actually the only two professors whose names I even remember, Dr. Juanita Fleming and Dr. Evelyn Geller, they supported me in their own way. And as a result, I think that I was able to make it through the University of Kentucky College of Nursing and go on to join the Navy. Now, I didn't join the Navy to see the world. Remember, I was an Army brat. Uh, I joined the Navy because I actually wanted to be a better nurse. I thought, you know, I have had a lot of theory, and now I want to get some hands on. And so I joined the Navy, but nobody told me that the Navy was, they were having race riots aboard the uh, aircraft carriers. So let's just put it this way. After coming from an institution uh, where there, uh, an organization where there was institutionalized racism and unconscious bias that I didn't know anything about, I was going right into another institution where there's institutionalized racism and unconscious bias. Um, and when I, the way I found out was that the then CNO, um, the Chief of Naval Operations, he came to address our commissioning class. Uh, this is where you go if you're going to become an officer. This is where you learn to, you know, to, to become an officer, Admiral Zumwalt. And if you really and truly are interested in reading a great leadership book, I would suggest reading the first half of his autobiography because it talks about how he really came in to, to really move the, the, the Navy forward. And this is you know, something that he says in one of his famous Z-grams. There is no black Navy. There is no white Navy. Just one Navy, the United States Navy. That was his philosophy. And that's really and truly what his leadership was all about. Because you see, he understood that we could not have separate navies and still protect the seas of the United States Navy, um, of the United States. Many, many years later, I. Uh, I was making rounds at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. And um, his wife had been admitted uh, for something, nothing really major. But it was our, um, our protocol, uh, if you were supervising, to, to, to drop in on the VIPs. And uh, very important persons, OK. Uh, and uh, when I saw that his name was on the roster, I thought, Oh my goodness, this is my opportunity to thank him. So I, um, I walked into the room and I greeted his wife and of course, you know, found out that she was doing fine. And then I walked over to him and by this time he looked like a hippie, you know, he had hair down to here and he was in jeans and uh, so I said, you know, Admiral, 
I said, you don't know me. I said, however, I said, because of you, I'm here. So he kind of looked at me and I said, you made it possible for me to stay in the Navy. I said, because you know, when I first joined the Navy, there were race riots. And I had called my father at home and I had told him, I'm not going to be in the Navy longer than my three years. And my father had said, oh, I think you will be because you're going to be part of the change of the Navy. And uh, my father, being the dad that he was, he knew better. But also, Admiral, you actually helped me to be able to make your dream come true. And it's about that time that I'm, sitting, I'm standing there and a tear rolled down his cheek. And he just said, thank you. And I said, no, thank you. Because what I would go on to do because of him, and I have to tell you that I still hold him up as one of the leaders that I most admire. Because of him, I was able to go on to have a very successful Navy career. Uh, and I cannot even imagine that I would be able to stand up in front of you right now as competent, self-assured, uh, and with the background if I had not had that Navy career. You see, I made the choice to not just to join the Navy, but I also made the choice to stay in the Navy. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm telling you this story. Well, one of the reasons that I'm telling you this story is because it shares with you a whole lot more about who I am than e even the wonderful bio that was just read to you. It lets you know that I am looking through many different lens. And all of those lens came from my experiences, my family of origin, my education, and the intersection of those experiences make me who I am today. And it also influences how I perceive my reality. And I would invite you all to begin to think about how many lens are you looking through and how does it impact how you interpret reality? Because it's going to impact the choices you make. You know, Robert Keegan says, the expectations upon us demand something more than mere behavior. The acquisition of specific skills or the mastery of a particular knowledge, they make demands on our minds, on how we know, on the complexity of our consciousness. Folks, we are facing very, very complex times today. And the thinking that our forefathers and our foremothers used that made them successful, that's not going to be the thinking that's going to potentially help us to move to the future. So you're probably saying, well, wait a minute, Marcia. Are you are saying that we, we don't think? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that at all. Hang in here with me, okay? So Robert Keegan, he's known as a constructive developmentalist, psychologist. Now let me break this down for you, okay? Constructivists, they believe that individuals create meaning through their experiences. Okay, can you live with that? Yeah, okay. I mean, think about it. When I was a six-year-old, I thought that there was going to be different colored water coming out of these two water fountains. 
that was my magical way of thinking, of making meaning of the world. As I grew older, I realized it had nothing to do with the color of the water as much as it had to do with the color of my skin. And then, as I grew even more older, I realized that it became symbolic of not necessarily separate but equal, but depending upon which water fountain you drank from, you weren't perhaps as good. So as we progress, we can begin to make meaning differently. That's how our minds grow. So from a constructivist perspective, our experiences, we're interpreting, interpreting them differently all the time. Now, developmentalists, they believe that individuals grow and change over time and enter different phases as they grow. So there's hope for us all. You know, Piaget, you know, those of you who are, are really into childhood development, we used to really believe that development stopped when you reach the age of 21 or 22. I mean, it was just, boom, you stopped. You were as good as you were going to get at 21 or 22. And the research, really, the research, probably some of you are thinking, thank goodness that is not the case, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and what we know now is that if you make the choice, you can develop the rest of your life but it has to do with your mind. So Robert Keegan, really and truly, you know, he helped me to see that all of these different experiences that I have had, really and truly, not only are contributing to who I ended up being, but who I can continue to be. I am a constructivist developmentalist, and I would imagine that probably half of you sitting out there, now that you know what it is, you're probably thinking, well, I am too, okay? <laughs> so let's look at this a little bit deeper. And it has to do with the fact that constructivist developmentalists, when you put it together, they believe that the systems that people use to make meaning in their lives change and they develop over time. And that means that we actually are able to become much more sophisticated and our thinking. So what does this mean? Well, it means that we can actually develop different ways of constructing our reality, and that all of us do have different ways of constructing reality, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, there's a variety of perspectives and concepts and vocabulary that we use to interpret the world. I mean, have you ever been sitting beside somebody and you're basically both looking at the same picture and that person is sharing with you their interpretation, and you're like, what? Nah, that's not what I see. And it isn't what you see. It's different because of who you are. We become, as we can become more sophisticated in our thinking, we can also become more sophisticated in recognizing our emotions and distinguishing them. Now, what some folks have actually been referring to this is, uh, they call it orders of mind, or forms of mind, or action logic. You know, basically, I'm gonna use Keegan's model here, and this is where I'm gonna throw a little theory in on you, okay? Uh, Keegan's model here, in terms of describing what we're talking about when we're talking about that developmental growth. Keegan and others, indicate that at some point in our lives, we are what we call the socialized mindset. And you can read there where it means that, you know, I'm a team player, faithful follower. I'm into alignment. I'm seeking direction. I'm reliant. I'm not a bad person. And then I may develop and develop into having a self-authoring mind, where now I may become more of a driver of my own agenda. I may actually have my own compass, my own frame. I may be a lot more independent. And then 
the transforming mind I may develop into means that I have arrived. I'm the meta leader, the leader who leads to learn. The multi, I can hold multi frames, multiple perspectives. Uh, I'm not just independent, I believe in interdependence. Now I know most of you are probably sitting there saying, uh-huh, that's where I am, self-transforming, okay? Well, unfortunately, only about 1% of the population hangs out there. Uh, most of us are either in so, uh, the socialized mindset or the self-authoring mindset, okay? Or we're someplace in between. The socialized mindset, loyalty to others is important. And that's who they identify with. They're shaped by the definitions and expectations of their environment. They see the world through others' perspectives. A common quote you may hear from them, it's important to find the person who can and will tell me whether I'm doing it right. Nothing wrong with being in this particular mindset. As a matter of fact, depending upon the role that you in and the demands that you have on you, this may be the right mindset for you. So I don't want you to look at any of these mindsets in terms of, well, I don't want to be there. Uh, no, because none of them are wrong or right. They just are. The self-authoring mindset, mindset, able to create your own personal stance or your agenda for judgment and action. And you can hold a lot of multiple perspectives while still maintaining your own. And you're liable to say, you know, if I don't live by my values and principles, who am I? Know anybody like that? And then the self-transforming mind set. They can step in from and reflect on the limits of their own stance, their own agenda, their own thinking. In other words, it's almost like they have become an observer of themselves. And they can see and they seek to understand the perspectives of others. They're aware of the world that's in motion and that it's constantly in motion. And what was true today may not be true tomorrow. And they will say, you know, my shadow, that dark side of me, which I used to hate, I now see as a gift. Because they are aware that they even have that shadow. So why is it even important for us to know that? It's because of the complexity of issues and problems and challenges that each of you will potentially walk into. And depending upon what your mindset is, you're going to be asked to participate in problem solving. And depending upon your problem, your, 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 your mindset, you're going to see that problem. You're going to interpret that problem, and you're going to come up with different solutions depending upon that mindset. And folks, that's the real beauty of diversity. We oftentimes, you know, when we think of diversity, we either think about it in terms of gender or in terms of color. But really and truly, the diversity that is going to really help us move ahead is what you can't see. And that's how people think. And so you're being able to appreciate the different mindsets that are sitting around the table without judgment is really important. It doesn't matter if you're in the patient care arena, if you're in administration, or if you're out in the community. That's really what's important. Safe travels to you, my dear. Okay. So different leaders exhibit different ways to interpret their surroundings and react when challenged. So I'm going to give you a little test here to see how much you've absorbed from me. I want to introduce you to Martha. 
Martha has 10 years of experience as a clinical nurse and five years as a nurse educator. She has worked closely with nurse managers and clinical nurses throughout the hospital and has a reputation as a knowledge, I suppose, I suppose to be knowledgeable and skilled nurse educator. She recently applied for and has been promoted to the role of Director of Nursing Education. After being in the position for six months, Martha agrees to attend a six-month hospital-sponsored leadership development program, which includes coaching. Rita, who is Martha's uh, coach, interviews Martha's direct reports to help Martha gain more insight into her leadership impact. They share that Martha has not really changed that much, and she makes it a habit to remind them that she is just one of them with a different title. Her direct reports express that they do not really feel comfortable with this attitude since they need to have someone who have their back. When Martha receives this feedback, she's surprised. And she replies to the coach, well, what do you think I should be doing in this new leadership job? What do you think she is? OK, good. You all are good. You got it. Exactly. Yeah, she's that socialite. And it doesn't mean that she's either bad or good, right? It just means that she has an opportunity for development. And so when we talk about people developing, that's what we're talking about. And it's not so much about her necessarily just acquiring skills, but also how she looks at or frames the way she sees the world. So, the socialized mindset. You got it. So, let's introduce you to someone else here. As a new CNO for a 400-bed safety net hospital located in the metropolitan area, Jolene decides that it will be important for her staff to hear how she has arrived to her new role. She starts her town hall meeting with a personal disclosure. My personal vision has always been to work in a hospital whose mission was to serve vulnerable populations. I realized that this vision stemmed from a deeply held commitment to social change and healthcare equity. I also realized that my leadership experiences in community hospitals serving a homogeneous population would not really prepare me. I have spent two years, two of the last five years, working as a, a healthcare administrator in a large uh, USAID uh, international. That's USAID is short for uh, uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and that's a real organization, okay, a government organization. Supported a hospital in Sierra Leone. Recently, I worked in the Office of uh, the Minority Health at HHS on public policy addressing health care inequities or disparities. I come to this role for keener insight and more passion on how we can work together to serve our community. I am inviting you to come on the journey with me. Where's Jolene? Come on. It's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to tell there. But yeah, she's pretty, she's pretty much in that self-authoring. Okay, she has her agenda. And what will happen if you don't necessarily get on the, on the wagon? Okay? Because remember, for all the strengths that each of these has, they also have some challenges that they have. And so the self-authoring mindset is like almost my way or, okay, the highway. So, last but not least, let's talk about Jennifer here, who has recently been appointed to lead a state coalition to address nurse safety in hospitals. She served in the Navy for 20 years as a Navy corpsman, has been a CNO at two hospitals, and is currently a CNE of a hospital system. She attended a community college associate degree nursing program while on active duty and used her GI Bill to pursue both her uh, <coughs> BSN and F, uh, MSN after retirement. She is currently enrolled in a PhD focused on social innovation. She is also a member of a city council task group to address homelessness of children in her city. As a foster child while growing up, an unwed mother, she feels a deep sense of urgency to address the challenge of the city's homeless city's uh, population. She has been monitoring the steady rise of homeless children admitted via ED at one of the local hospitals. 
and it is alarming. She has decided to mobilize some influential stakeholders in the community, the hospital system, as well as the university faculty to join her on the city task group and in the state coalition. She has decided to increase her yoga class attendance uh, because she's already feeling the physical tension and mental fatigue. fatigue. She has also hired an executive coach and specifically makes the request that she is looking for a thinking partner and someone to challenge her thinking. Where's Jennifer? I'm gonna fool you on this one. She's on the journey. She's on the journey. And so I wanted to do that to alert you that we don't necessarily fall real cleanly in each one of these phases. And most of us are on the journey. And that's okay. Because, you know, the self-transforming mindset is very, very hard for us to get to. And like I said, only about 1% of the population of leaders that they have researched actually is there. So, in any given moment, we have two options or choices. And that is to step forward in growth or to step back in safety. And when we are talking about, or at least when I'm talking about stepping forward in growth, what I'm talking about is developmental growth. How do you begin to expand or get bigger in terms of your own mindset? Well, here's some opportunities. Take the opportunity to seek different and novel experiences while intentionally checking your judgment. We are always judging, folks. Always. If it's not, well, I really like those shoes, to, mm, where'd she get that dress, to, I can't believe that I just heard him say that. Isn't that stupid? Okay? But we are constantly, and it's usually negative. And so being able to not just step into, having the courage to step into, and to really get, uh, 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 have that experience that's novel to you, but suspending your judgment as well as you can. Challenging your own assumptions about what you think is happening around you. Practice asking, so, hmm, what else could this mean? Or what else could be true? You know, when I'm coaching leaders, uh, and especially executives, this is probably one of the hardest things for them to do. And that is to distinguish their assumptions from fact. Because they actually get the two mixed up. And so being aware of when you are making an assumption really and truly is a significant growth spurt that you will have. Open yourself to new possibilities by telling yourself a different story. In other words, if you tell the story one time, tell it a second and a third, but from a different perspective. And you may need a thinking partner, but as you are telling somebody about your interpretation of what you think may have happened, so have that thinking partner to say, okay, so tell the story as if you were somebody else. So you put that somebody else's hat on and well, if I was somebody else, this is how I, and by the time you have gotten to that third or fourth telling of that story, see how you will have already broadened how you're actually seeing what it is that you're seeing, okay? Listen to learn rather than to win or to fix. You know, we as nurses, we love winning and we certainly love fixing. Uh, and in this day and age, we have to really and truly learn to listen to folks so that we can listen to learn. It is so important, especially in this new day of health care and how we want to establish relationships with our patients and with the consumers. 
and then connect to your emotions and your thoughts and learn how to articulate them as part of your experience. I was having some fun with the dean and you know we were actually had introduced a technique to her in terms of learning how to even just articulate your your experience. But most of us when it comes to articulating our emotions, we're pretty much emotionally illiterate because we don't have enough words to use. So expanding your vocabulary. And last but not least, look at whose shoulders you're standing on. I'm my father's daughter. I'm my mother's daughter. And I'm so much more. Being aware of all of the identities that are separate, that intersect, but who contribute to who you are. And you have to slow down and reflect to be able to do that. And in choice making, remember, there is always that space. And in that space, we have the opportunity to make a choice that's gonna help us to become better adults. Thank you. They're probably all wondering, let me see, which mindset am I going to? <laughs> Come on, you guys. What are you curious about? OK, so what did you disagree with me about? Did anybody dis Who disagreed with me? Mark's trying to get some points. So I guess, you know. Uh, that's right. Okay, okay. Thank God I wasn't going to the restroom, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to put you on the spot, uh, but if you could maybe speak a little bit to uh, maybe some immunity to change exercises uh, that can help us challenge some of our own assumptions. What's that now? Immunity to change exercises. Oh, so you're like familiar with immunity to, to change, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the one that you probably know is the change mapping, uh, where you literally are, are, are uh, uh, challenged, challenging your uh, assumptions. However, one of the exercises, and I was actually introducing this to uh, uh, the dean and, and some of her faculty this morning, and it really does not come out of the immunity to change, okay, but it does uh, fit into that vertical development. And, and in, the, in the coaching world, we, we have what it's called vertical development and horizontal development. And you all are doing both, okay? Vertical development has to do with how am I developing my thinking, okay? And uh, horizontal development has to do with the acquisition of skills. And usually at the undergraduate level, we are so into, you know, uh, getting skills. Uh, and when you go into continuing education, it's about the acquisition of skills. When really and truly, it's a matter of developing vertically and horizontally. And part of that has to do with my being able to be in touch with myself and being able to articulate my experience. And so what I was, when I was uh, sharing is that if I can actually objectively, let's say, you know, share what I have just heard somebody say, let's say that you and I, uh, and it does say observer, right? So I guess you are observer, okay? So this is the observer, okay? And let's say that I have observed him in a meeting and he, uh, and I used this yesterday with Karina, you know, he rolls his eyes when I'm saying something. And I'm just like, and I see this. And so the next day, I'm thinking, okay, should I talk to him about this? Why did he roll his eyes? So I say, observer, yesterday, 
I, you know, was in the meeting and what I observed was that you were rolling your eyes when I was making a comment about, you know, da-da-da-da-da. And I don't know what that rolling of the eyes meant, but to be quite honest with you, I think that it probably meant that you didn't agree with what I was saying. I've just expressed my observation, my thought. I felt disappointed that you wouldn't come up and you know share with me or even share during the group. And I was also a little bit sad that you would you know roll your eyes in a meeting like that with everybody sitting around watching. Um, I've just expressed my emotion. What I would like to request is what was going on yesterday? You know, let me in. What were your thoughts that you didn't share? Well, lo and behold, the observer here may, first of all, not even remember having rolled his eyes, okay? But secondly, he may have been rolling his eyes, and this is what he may come back and say, uh, you know, Marcia, this is a little awkward, but I actually was, uh, I had my phone under the table, <laughs> and I had just gotten a text, and it was like, you, it was one of those, oh, you know what moments. And I was like, Phew. and I, Oh, oh, okay. I thought it was about me. You see the difference? And how many times have we made up the wrong story? And we have not bothered to check it out. And so that would be a strategy in terms of, instead of confronting somebody in terms of, well, you bad person, rolling your eyes at me. You know, it's, what, what was going on? You know, what actually contributed to your rolling your eyes at the meeting? Now, to be able to get to that point where you're able to, to do that, have that kind of conversation, it takes some mental sophistication. You have to really be in touch with yourself, and you have to really be able to, not necessarily, not, uh, uh, you have to be able to control your emotions. You're going to have them, okay? But it also means that I'm going to let you know that you have had a certain impact on me. Okay? So I use both the immunity to change as well as that work uh, with uh, the Experience Cube in my coaching. Did that answer your question and provide you a different? Okay. Great. Anybody else? So actually, I'm not going to allow anybody else. I'm just going to just <laughs> put the staff here. We will have Marsha Hughes Reese slide presentation available, released to you with her email. I know Marsha would love to hear from you if you have questions. She will be around a little bit longer, but I would like to ask everyone to give a round of applause to Marsha right now. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And I kid you not, and I have individuals in this audience that can testify. I've never heard the audience so quiet you could have heard a pin drop. So it was powerful. They were, they were, they were reading the text. No. <laughs> it was powerful and impactful, and you make us so proud. Thank you for all your contributions. Well, thank you. Profession. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to all of our guest lecturers, what we say, pick one of your favorite leadership books, one. And um, Marsha is going to call out the number, and there, there's five of them. Okay. We have five books we're going to give away. When she says the number, that's enough, isn't it? No, I, I need, I got one more, one more, one more. Okay, one more. Okay, okay. 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 But this is her favorite book. It's called Clear Leadership, Sustaining Real Collaboration and Partnership at Work by Gervais C. Bush. Mm -hmm. And it's one of her favorites. And what I just explained uh, is in this book. Yay. Okay. 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 Nine seven two nine five one four. Who is it? Red Sand. Come on down. Come on. Your name and program of study. Hurry, hurry. We're okay. Gonna We're gonna move on <laughs> here. Your name and program of study. Your name and program of study. Alessandra Nico. I study MSN leadership. Thank you for that. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Are you ready? Go. Okay. Nine seven two nine five two two. 
Is it Rick back there in the left hand corner? Come on, Bola. Ah. I'll speak for Bola, Bola. PhD alumni and college and nursing faculty. We stole it from University of Cincinnati. Yes. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, next. 9729559. Yes, and look what she and look what she is wearing. Uh -huh. It's Katie. Your hair. This is the commander of our Air Force ROTC. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, nine seven two nine four four eight. Here we yeah, go. come on down. There Wonderful. Okay. And last? Okay. 972-9543. We're going to say it one more time. That might have 972-9543. Okay. okay one more here. Okay. 972-9445. I just I just heard somebody go. Oh, okay. 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 9729503. Oh, okay. And your program of study postmasters acute care. Acute care. Yes. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you all.